And it's titled, Going Forward by Going Back. And our text for this lesson this evening is in Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse 16. If you, would, if you want to turn with me there to Jeremiah 6, chapter 16, that's going to be the text for our lesson this evening. Starting in verse 16. Thus says the Lord, Stand in the ways you see and ask for the old paths where the good way is and walk in it. Then you will find rest for your souls. We live in a progressive society. Advances are made in technology every day which enhance our lives and make us more productive with less physical effort. Many people strive to keep themselves abreast of the newest things that are coming out. The newest fashion, the latest cars, the best, the biggest, and the most modern stuff is in high demand. We are a progressive society of people who strive to push ever forward and we live in a world that is ever changing from day to day. Sadly, the progress that we are making in the realm of religious matters does not seem to be keeping up with our society as a whole. Our advancements in science and technology are resulting in God being pushed out of our lives to be replaced with worldly things. God is being expelled from our schools, voted out of our government, and forgotten by our society. In the religious sector of mankind, many today who still claim Jesus Christ as their Savior, do so according to their own wishes and their own ideas on how he should be served. What began in the first century as one church has evolved into literally thousands of them across the face of the earth, each with their own method of worship and service to God. Many people today worship God how they see fit. They serve God according to their own desires on how it should be done. No one looking out into the world today that can deny that churches are divided. Our society is degrading morally. We are killing millions of babies each year, we as a people. Through abortion, our prisons are full. The entertainment that is piped into our homes is for the most part intolerable and at best indecent. Our government is crooked. Our society is sinking into a morass of corruption and is eating away at the very foundation of our beings. One would have to be blind to miss what's going on. How do we fix it? What's the solution? How do we go forward from here? To answer this question, let's look at a real-life example from the Old Testament of what a king faced with the destruction of his whole nation did in order to move forward forward. Let us call to mind that great king Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, who was so evil that God was going to destroy Judah because of the things he did. But Hezekiah, his son, did right in the sight of the Lord, and God repented of the destruction that he was going to inflict on Judah. This is in Jeremiah 26, 19. Did he, speaking of Hezekiah, not fear the Lord and seek the Lord's favor? And the Lord relented concerning the doom which he had pronounced against them. And that's in uh, Jeremiah 26, 19. Hezekiah averted the impending destruction of Judah because he sought the favor of God. In 2 Kings 18, 1 through 6, we learn that Hezekiah tore down the altars in the high places and got rid of all of the idols. In verse 6, we read the following, For he speaking of Hezekiah, held fast to the Lord. He did not depart from following him, but kept his commandments, which the Lord had commanded Moses. Hezekiah was returning his nation to the commandments of Moses. He was moving forward by moving back. Moving on in Second Chronicles 29, we read of Hezekiah's restoration of the temple, which Ahaz, his father, corrupted. The temple was repaired and cleansed. The sacrifices were resumed, and temple worship, according to the law of Moses, returned to Judah. In Second Chronicles 29-25, we read, And he, speaking of Hezekiah, stationed the Levites in the house of the Lord with cymbals, with stringed instruments, and with harps, according to the commandment of David, 
of Gad the king's seer, and of Nathan the prophet. For thus was the commandment of the Lord by his prophets. Now Gad and Nathan and David were all contemporaries. They were all three prophets. Hezekiah was getting the layout for the temple worship from the commandments of prophets who had been dead for several centuries. Hezekiah was following the old paths as he moved his nation forward. It's a shame that his predecessor did not follow in those footsteps. The doom that Hezekiah averted for Judah because of his righteousness was only postponed. The application we can make today is that if Hezekiah could return his nation to the favor of God by following the old paths, by returning to the commandments of God by his prophets, then we can too. If it worked for Hezekiah, it would work for us. We, like Hezekiah, can ensure that we go forward as a nation and as a people of God by going back and seeking the old paths. How do we do that? How do we seek the old paths? Number one, we go back to the Bible. Hezekiah went to the words of the prophets written centuries before him in order to know how to set up the temple. Hezekiah recognized that the ancient writings were authoritative, and if he restored the temple and set up the worship according to the record of how it was commanded by God, that it would be done according to his will. That's common sense. Hezekiah understood if he did it the way they did it in times past, they would be assured of being what they were then, faithful children of God. Hezekiah understood that there was a pattern to follow in respect to the house of God and the worship they were to offer. First Chronicles 28, 11 through 12, if you want to turn there. First Chronicles 28, 11 through 12, starting in verse 11. Then David gave to Solomon his son the pattern of the porch and of the houses thereof and of the treasuries thereof, and of the upper chambers thereof, and of the inner parlors thereof, and of the place of the mercy seat, and the pattern of all that he had by the Spirit. Where did David get the plans for the temple? Got them directly from God through the Spirit. David further states the source of the plans for this temple a few verses later in, in verse 19. All this, said David, the Lord made me understand in writing by his hand upon me all the works of these plans. When David charged his son Solomon with the task of building the temple, he gave him the plan for it that he had received from God. Hezekiah knew that David had the plan for the temple, and for the worship, and he recognized that he needed to follow that pattern precisely. Hezekiah also knew that if he wanted to please God, he could not add to nor take away from anything God wanted. If you want to turn to Deuteronomy 4, we're going to look at a verse there that doubtless anybody living under the law of Moses faithfully would be familiar with this. Deuteronomy 4, starting in verse 1. Now, O Israel, listen to the statutes and the judgments which I teach you to observe, that you may live and go in and possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers is giving you. You shall not add to the word which I command you, nor take from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. In Deuteronomy 12.32, very similar. In Deuteronomy 12.32, Whatever I command you, be careful to observe it. You shall not add to it, nor take away from it. Hezekiah understood that in order to please God, he had to adhere to the pattern, adding nothing to, nor taking anything away from the Word of God. Hezekiah knew and in order for the nation of Judah to go forward, they had to go back. They had to go back. So what about us today? What application can we make for ourselves today, seeing that we do not worship in the temple in Jerusalem and do not follow the law of Moses? Do we have a pattern we're supposed to follow today? Let's turn to 2 Timothy 1, 13 and 14. 
Do we have a pattern that we are supposed to follow? Well, if we do, then you'd think it'd be mentioned. In 2 Timothy 1, verse 13 and 14, Paul wrote, Hold fast the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me in faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. In Romans 6, 17 and 18, Paul wrote this, But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of of doctrine to which you were delivered. The Greek words for form and pattern in these two verses carry the meaning of a stamp or a model used for imitation or replication. We absolutely have a pattern we can look to. Paul wrote by inspiration that we have a pattern of sound words and a form or standard of doctrine to which we can conform ourselves to, to which we can look back to. Where do we find the pattern we are to live by today? We don't live under the Old Covenant anymore. There's no more temple. There's no more Levitical worship. There's no more animal sacrifices that we are to observe. That old system, the law of Moses, has been abolished. Ephesians 2.15, nailed to the cross of Christ. Colossians 2.14. So since that law is no longer in effect, what law replaced it? It's called the law of Christ in Galatians 6.2. The royal law. In James 2.8 and verse 12, or in, in James 2.8 and verse 12 of the same chapter, it's called the law of liberty. In Romans 8.2, while contrasting with the law of Moses, Paul called it the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. It is identified with other terms as well. In Hebrews 8.8, 8, it's called a new covenant. In Matthew 26.28 and several other places, Jesus Christ referred to it as the New Testament. Paul referred to it as the New Testament in 2 Corinthians 3, 6, and the Hebrew writer referred to it as the New Testament in Hebrews 9, 15. It is called the faith 43 times in the King James Version of the New Testament. The most common term for what replaced the law of Moses is the gospel, which occurs 83 times in the King James Version of the New Testament Scriptures. All of these terms and others refer to the same thing. Each of these terms are representative of an aspect of the system of faith under which we live now. Concerning the promise of God, it is the new covenant. Concerning the blood of Christ and what it does for us, it is a new testament. Concerning man's role in God's redemptive process, it is called the faith. By faith we do things. Hebrews chapter 11 is full of a whole list of people who did things obediently by faith. Concerning God's role in the salvation of man, it is called the grace of God. Concerning the body of teachings which make it, up, make it all up, it is called the doctrine of Christ. Concerning the joyous hope that we have through God's redemptive works, it is called the good news or simply the gospel. Concerning the pattern of living or rule of conduct which a Christian is required to live by, it is called a law. All of these terms represent aspects of the system of faith which is contained in the New Testament Scriptures. Take any one of these out, and it's incomplete. Revelations 22:19 is the New Testament equivalent of what we read in Deuteronomy a little while ago. Do not take anything away. Do not add anything to. It's less than the whole counsel of God, and we will fall short of His expectations. Add anything to it, and it's more than he authorized, which violates a number of New Testament scriptures, such as 1 Corinthians 4, 6, 2 John 9, and Revelation 22, 18. Hezekiah went back to the Old Testament scriptures to find out how to go forward in an acceptable fashion and according to the will of God. Today, we can go back to the New Testament so that we can go forward in the same manner that Hezekiah did so many centuries ago. We can follow his example. We could go back to the church of the New Testament. The reason that God was going to destroy Judah was because the Israelites had departed from the acceptable worship of the one true and living God. They had divided themselves from the truth. They had gone after man-made gods 
and worshipped them according to their own lusts and desires. Today, when we look out into the world, we see the worship of several false gods, such as Buddha, Allah, Brahma, just to name three out of many. And to make matters worse, the worship of the one true and living God of the Christians is fragmented into thousands of different denominations, each believing and practicing a variant form of Christianity. The Bible condemns division and sectarianism in the strongest possible terms. 1 Corinthians 1, 10 through 13, chapters 11, verse 18, and chapter 12, verse 25. Jesus Christ urged and prayed for unity among believers. John 17 and 21. But the unity cannot be with those who practice false teachings and false gospels. The Bible pronounces a curse upon those who teach another gospel than the one delivered. Galatians 1.8. We were looking at that just last week. The Bible commands faithful Christians to stand apart from those who are in error. Ephesians 5, 12, and 2. 2 Thessalonians 3, 4, chapters 3, 14, 1 Timothy 6, 3, 2 Timothy 3, 3, and 2 John 9, 11. There is plenty of scripture in the Bible that says that we are to separate ourselves from those who teach and practice religious error. Faithful Christians cannot unify with those who are in error and have divided themselves from the truth of God's Word. So we have thousands of bodies of people who claim Jesus Christ as their Savior, but practice variations of the one faith taught in the Bible. The church is a body of Christ, Colossians 1.18, which reads, if you want to turn to that, Colossians 1 and verse 18, the church is a body of Christ, Verse 18, and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. If you want to turn over to Ephesians 1, 22 through 23, it's a similar verse, says the same thing. Ephesians 1, 22, 23, starting in 22, And hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body. The body and the church are the same thing. Paul further taught that there is only one body, following one faith in Ephesians 4, 4. Very familiar passage of Scripture. Since the body of Christ is the church, and Scriptures teach there is only one body, and the only conclusion we can draw from that is that there is only one church. If there's one body, there's only one church. It was a desire of Jesus that his people be united. When he spoke of building his church, he promised only one. Matthew 16, 18. Jesus Christ reconciles man to God through one body which is the church, Ephesians 2, 13 through 16. And this New Testament reality of one church has far-reaching implications for the divided church that we see today. Number one, if there is only one body, church, same thing in Scripture, practicing one faith, then modern-day denominationalism is contrary to God's design for His church and is therefore condemned. God did not set up denominationalism. So when you see denominationalism, it has to be contrary to his will. Number two, if only one body or church, same thing, is found in Scripture, then it is absolutely not true that one church is as good as any other. Number three, if only one body, church, same thing, is found in Scripture, then those who believe they can attend the church of their choice are either mistaken or they are deliberately living in defiance of God's Word. Number four, if there is only one body, church, in the New Testament, then any one other than the one found within the Bible, and it is a counterfeit of that one true church, an unauthorized copy of coming from the mind of man and not from Scripture. Number five, if there is only one body, church, in the New Testament, then it is essential, it is essential for men and women to be members of it and only it. 
in a spirit of love and concern and without any malice or hostility. We need to stress the biblical picture of the church as a non-denominational, Christ-centered body of a people fully committed to doing the will of God and living according to His Word. Non-denominational, undenominational, anti-denominational. That's the way that we, that we need to be because that is what is supported by the Scriptures. Undenominational, non-denominational, and anti-denominational. The New Testament church was not made up of many denominations. Denominations come into existence when people do more or less than God commands. To do exactly what He commands, no more and no less, results in an undenominational, undivided body, church of Christ. The first century church existed without denominations. The work and worship of the church can be performed without them. They're not necessary. They are a barrier to unity and a cause of confusion and misguided error. If all mankind joined together and bound their lives to living in obedience to the will of God, according to the New Testament Scriptures, adding nothing to, taking nothing away, there would only be one body of believers claiming Christ as their Savior. We could unite and go forward by going back to the church that Jesus built and bought with his blood. We can go back to being just a Christian. In today's religious world, when asked what kind of faith one has, being called just a Christian is something that you don't hardly ever see anymore. Upon declaring oneself a Christian, the next question might be, well, what kind of Christian? There were no Baptist Christians in the first century, neither were there Presbyterian Episcopalian, Methodist, Lutheran, Mennonite, Catholic, or Pentecostal Christians. They didn't exist. There were no hyphenated terms for Christians back then. They were just called Christians, disciples, children of God, believers. Paul condemned this sort of sectarian division in 1 Corinthians 1, 10 through 13. If you want to turn there, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, starting in verse 10. Speaking about sectarian division within the Corinthian denomination, starting in verse 13, where he wrote, <clears throat> excuse me, Now I plead with you, brethren, I plead. By the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. Now I say this, and, and, and let's pay, pay really good attention to this, because this is relevant to what we see going on today. Now I say this, verse 12, that each of you says, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Some of these people in the Corinthian church were dividing themselves up into groups. They were separating themselves from one another, and they were saying, well, you know, we are following what Peter says, and we're not going to follow what you say. But And this other group is saying, well, we're going to follow after what Paul says, and we're not going to, we, we don't care what Peter says. Listen to what Paul divided him. Is Christ divided? What, what Paul asked him. Is Christ divided when we divide the body of Christ. When anybody divides the church, the body of Christ, they divide Christ. You cannot separate Jesus Christ from His body. Any time that there is division, it divides Christ. Was Paul crucified for you? Did Paul die for these people? They're following after the words of Paul. Yet it was Christ who paid the price for them. 
This kind of, of behavior is condemned in Scripture in the strongest possible terms. And yet, when we look out into the religious world, we see that very thing. You've got people wearing names of somebody that did not die for them. They're, if they're not wearing the name, they're, they're taking on the name of a creed or a conviction, as they call it. Not things that are found in the Scriptures. Paul condemns the wearing of any name other than Christ for ourselves. To do so causes Christ's body or church to be divided among men, and this cannot be. When the world looks at us, they should see Jesus Christ and no thing or no body but Jesus Christ. They should never look upon us and see another man or another creed. We do not serve men. We serve Christ. Other men did not die for us. Christ did. Other men did not establish the body, the church of Christ. Christ did. When the world looks at us, they need to see Christ and not Paul or Apollos or Luther or Calvin or the Pope. Or John Wesley. If everyone claiming Christ as their Savior called themselves a Christian, no more and no less, then Jesus would be the then Jesus would be the only one in view within a unified body of believers. In conclusion, we must never give up hope that all who claim Jesus Christ as their Savior will unite and put an end to the division that we have in the religious world. Hezekiah went forward by going back. We can go forward by going back as well. We can all go back to the Bible and the Bible alone. We can reject all man-made creeds and let the Scriptures be our final and only authority for what we do and what we teach. We can seek God's will through His Word, adding nothing to, taking nothing away, and committing our lives in obedience to His will in all things, no matter where it may lead us. We can go back to the Lord's church, worshiping in spirit and in truth in accordance to His will. <coughs> Excuse me. We can look at the way faithful Christians worshiped in the first century and use that as a pattern for our worship today. It is possible because the Lord's church was to be eternal. Daniel prophesied of a kingdom <clears throat> that would stand forever in Daniel 2.44. Jesus pointed out that even Hades could not prevail against it. Matthew 16.18. Since the Lord's body, church, was to last forever, it must be possible to be in that body, in that church, and be just a Christian today. By going back to the Bible, we can be assured of worshiping as God wills and not as man wills. Colossians 2.23 We can be assured of approaching God according to His righteousness and not our own, as it says in Romans 10.3. This is the only real hope for unity in the divided religious world that we live in today. It has worked before it can work again. Our only hope is for all believers in Christ to walk faithfully in the old paths, following the steps of our Lord. We can be in the 21st century just what they were in the 1st century if we will believe what they believed, worship how they worshipped, obey what they obeyed, and observe what they observed. We can go back to the Bible back to the church, and back to being what they were then. We must go back if we want to truly go forward with any assurance in our hope. We're going to read Jeremiah 6.16 again, and then we'll have the invitation and the lesson will be yours. Jeremiah 6.16, our opening text. Thus says the Lord, stand in the ways and see, and ask for the old paths where the good way is, and walk in it. Then you will find rest for your souls. If there is anybody here tonight that has any need, if there's anybody here tonight that needs to be baptized, wants to be baptized and added to the body, the one body, the church, and if there's anybody here tonight that needs the prayers of the saints, be whatever reason they be, this is your opportunity now. Come, please, as we stand and sing the song of encouragement. <clears throat> 